Let's go ahead and pray before we start. Father, thank you so much that you've given us the understanding. Thank you for your spirit to help, that you help us to understand and help us to see the, the validity and the reasoning why we need to understand history. Because, Father, history helps us to understand all the things that have went on so we can understand today. Father, please give us more wisdom and help us to understand what we see. And we commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, history. We are going to be going into lots of history because history is going to help us to understand what is happening today. We're actually in a point in the Protestant Reformation in that everything's now going to change. Religions are changing. Science is added in. Age of exploration. Slavery. Abuse of the workers the rise of the state, which will then come into the point of why America did what they did. Now, if you haven't read my, uh, the thing I wrote on church and the state, please make sure you read that because that's going to be very, coming very important. But today what I decided to do was I decided that I wanted to do something for you guys and help you to understand what the people went through back in the 15th, 15th and 16th century. When you were going, so let's say you were in a canton in Switzerland, and all of a sudden they changed to the Reformed faith. You're no longer a Catholic. Guess what? There's no more Catholic church. Guess what you are? You are Reformed faith, whether you like it or not. And you were kind of forced on this. This was a very, this was a very tough thing for people. They had to learn things completely different. So what I did is I wrote a fictional account this is most, part, part of this is fiction. And what I did is I put in a guy in Switzerland, my family's from Switzerland, so I actually used my family's last name, Mathis, um, and I, I started him when he was in, he was a Catholic, and just turned into, got turned into a, a Protestant environment. So what happened was, was as he was going through the time, he was starting to understand what's, what's going on. I'm being told to do this. I'm being told to do that. I have to learn to read this. I have to learn to say this. We're now speaking in German. We're not speaking in Latin anymore. He had a really tough time. And what I did over the decades, I went through and I began to show you guys stuff that was going on. Through him, he's going to relay to you what was going on, like with the Huguenots. Huguenots, when we talk about them today, persecution of the uh, Protestants, he's going to go into that. So I'm hoping through that you'll understand better what people went through. And, and you'll see his change as time is going on, the change in his heart and where he wants to go. He wants to now start, and before he was very pro-Catholic, and then he becomes very anti-Catholic towards the end because of all the problems. So then I also put in the, something about the 30-year war. We're not really going to cover that much, but we've got to go into it. It is one of the most devastating wars. So if you really want to, now I wrote in here that, you know, about five, it was like around 500,000 people died. That was just the civilians. It was more like 4 million. Now, if we looked at the population density today versus then, it's more like around 40 to 50 million people would have died. That war was devastating. That war tore people apart. It tore families apart. You think the Civil War was bad in our country? Nothing compared to this. And from now on, everybody's going to start changing. And from this point also, after the 30-year war, people are going to start really questioning, do we really need religion? So today, as we're going through, we learn about why everybody, people hate religion and stuff. That was one of the reasons. Now, it wasn't God's fault. God didn't tell them to go to battle with each other. And as Christians, apologetically, we need to tell people that it's not God that's causing this problem. It's us. So please understand when I go through it. And it's kind of hard because it's some of the stuff went on. Now, finally, what I did is I put something else in here. I, the last thing I did is I wrote something from Calvin. I put something from Calvin in here. Calvin was uh, put to a challenge, a particular big, big priest, like an archbishop guy, big guy in the Roman Catholic Church, wanted to bring all of Switzerland back into the fold. They got, he wanted them to be all Catholic again. So what Calvin did is Calvin wrote to him and say, uh-uh, we're not going back there. 
Now, and it's, he's kind of a little, he's a little harsh in here. I kind of got rid of kind of, I kind of give you only about, I give you just a small section of what he wrote to him. But it's pretty hardcore saying, no, we're not going back there again. And he explained the reason why. So that's at the end. Please, when you read that from Calvin, it may be a little difficult to understand because it's written in 16th century stuff. But understand that what he's basically saying is, no, because what, all the things you guys did, we don't want to do that again. So that's this here. So please, I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know if you like it. Because you know the problem is I tried writing fiction. This was like one of my first fictional writing. But let me show you my very first fictional writing to show you how well, how far I've grown. So this is Freddie Chipmunk. Uh, this is what I wrote when I was in like, I think it was like third or fourth grade. You can see my name, John McConkey, Eric, Eric Warden, John Leaf, you know. This, this was my very first attempt at, at fiction. I thought it was going to be a bestseller, but it fell pretty flat. And Freddie was not very a happy chipmunk anyway. So I think he died in the end, but anyway, because he got scared. Oh yeah, he was eaten by Bigfoot. That's right, Bigfoot ate him. So that was my first, my first job at trying to get fiction. This is my third. I had another one, but I, I, I couldn't find that one. Yeah, my, my, best, my, my best friend, we, my friend and I went west. I was like fifth grade, I wrote that, and he died. I don't know why everybody dies from Bigfoot or something, who knows. But that's what I did. So, but hopefully you're going to find that this is a little bit more up to date. All right, so the Catholic Reformation. Yes, the Catholics did have a Reformation. They had what we call the Counter-Reformation. Because now you think that the Catholics are going to sit still while the Protestants are blasting them and telling them, no, we need to change, we're going to move away from this, this we don't want to do this anymore. You think the Catholics sat still? Now let's just say if someone came, came, someone came to town and started ripping really bad on Christians and going, saying nasty things about Christians and trying to get people away from Christianity, would we not go there and say, no, we don't want that? Of course. Well, that's what the Catholics did. So we've got to understand why they did it. So the Counter-Reformation basically started about 1545. It really went, there was a thing called the Council of Trent, and that went on for almost 20 years. And it literally, for some reason, was, whenever they do councils, it goes on for like decades. I don't know what they do there. But anyway, but the, but the thing is, it finally ended with the, the um, 30-year war. Because the 30-year war, again, that was devastating. So the counter, the, Catholics wanted to do something in response. So during this time, that's when the wars of religion started. And it is truly called the wars of religion. Most of the time, it was usually somewhat in the Holy Roman Empire, somewhat in France. We're going to go into those lands here in just a little bit to help you to understand what's going on. But they were going and they were just killing people like crazy because there was more at stake than just what church you're going to go to. It was not just what church you're going to go to, but we're really tired of being under the Catholic influence, and the Catholics are basically running the governments. We don't want anything to do with them. Get us away from that. And so people are starting to say, no, 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 we don't want to be run by the Domicis. We're, we're not going to be run by, the, by the, um, the people in Austria, the people in Spain. We're not going to be run by those guys anymore. So these guys, they fought. And they fought a lot. And it really went on for almost probably 70 years of battles. So a lot of people actually turned away from the church. And we're going to start seeing, and actually I put some of that in here, some of the philosophers like Immanuel Kant and those guys basically started saying, is religion really needed after this? Well, I can understand why they said that, because it's pretty bad. So the Council of Trent. Now, we would think that after all that Luther did, and by the way, I, I also want to remind you guys that we haven't went into this yet, but Luther was only one of three different, different, three different reformers. We had the Anabaptists going at the same time and the Reformed, which turned out to be Calvinism and Presbyterians afterwards. So they were going all at the same time. So multiple places were dealing with different things here. So what the Catholics did, they said, all right, we're going to get together and find out what do we do? Now, do you think they would change anything at all? No. 
They almost changed nothing, except they said, we're going to deal with the abuses. That's really what they wanted to do is deal with the abuses. They weren't dealing with the problem of, you know, who is Mary, who is, you know, the problem with indulgences. They kept indulgences. They kept all those things. The veneration of Mary was actually increased. They increased it. Also, Vatican I, which we'll get into later on, they basically started saying, okay, well, we now believe Mary was sinless. Which is in contra contradiction that the Bible says, no one is righteous, not even one. It contradicts that. So how can Mary be sinless? So then is she a God also? If you think about it, how, only God was sinless, right? How could Mary be sinless? So this is the problem. And they actually reaffirmed it. And in the Vatican I basically said, um, we're going to make Mary up here. She's now sinless. So the mass also continued. But what they decided to do, whereas you're going you're gonna to learn from the guy here that he had to learn everything in German because now the Protestant says, we're going to start speaking in the, the language of the people. That's a good thing. The Catholics decided, no, nope, we're going to still st stay in Latin. And you're going to find through this that a lot of people didn't even understand what Latin said. They didn't really know because they didn't speak Latin. The priests spoke the Latin. So they, that would not change. They wouldn't change the language until 1965, Vatican II. So even in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, 1950s, they were still doing everything in Latin. So the vernacular period. Now, granted, I'm not saying all churches did, because a lot of, some Catholic churches did tend to go a little bit more that direction, more towards the vernacular and stuff, but it finally was changed like 50 years ago. So. so also more power was given to the bishop. The bishop was the guy who was over multiple churches. The archbishop is over the country. Okay, the archbishop of the country, then we have the bishops, and then we have the priests. So more power was given to the bishops to go through and give, do things. But one of the problems that happened, remember what the two problems were? Simony, Simon, Remember Simon Magnus tried to pay for things to get this stuff free? So Simony, remember, that was a problem that the bishops were being purchasing their offices. Again, what would you like if the preacher actually purchased his office? He shows up once every four, eh, four weeks or so, and once every two months, because he's working in multiple offices. And he gets paid for all of them. That's what happened. These bishops would have one office, then they'd have another office and they get paid for both of them. Bishops were very high paying. If you read my last week's paper, what it talks about, the bishops were actually very well paid and the priests were not. So it's kind of like what we found out at the, with the Communist Party that the people had nothing, but the Communist Party was well taken care of. It's very normal in the Communist Party. It was well taken care of, everybody else was down below. So. Protestants also began, you know, the wars. The Protestants did um, lead some of those wars. But the big guys, usually ruled by Louis XIV, which is France. The Habsburgs, that's Spain and Austria. Now you're like, how could they be over two countries? Well, you got to remember, if you've ever studied king, the, you know, people's kings, I'll tell you, if you ever want to have an interesting study, read or watch some stuff on all of England's kings. You're going to find that most of England's kings weren't even English. They were, they were either Dutch, they were, um, they were German, they were French, and what they did is they married each other, each other's sister. You know, so you're gonna, so you're going to marry into this family over here, and you're going to marry into this family. And so you're going to find that when the succession of kings happen, they have to look in other countries for the succession because since they intermarried between countries, you're now having this child. So the child may be over here in Germany, and that 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 guy in Germany is now the succession to the king of England. I know it's strange. 
And it was kind of weird, but that's what they did. So the thing is, that's why there's multiple things going on. So what they wanted to do is break the power. Now, I talked about that. Does anybody know when the power of the Habsburgs was actually broken? Come on, smart guys. It's a war. Which war broke the Habsburgs back? Which one do you think? French Revolution, that was good, but that was France, though. This is, these are Spain. This is Spain. Yeah, good. No, good point. Good, good, good. You're, you're. So, yeah, no, you're fine. So, it was World War I. It was 1916, 300 years later. The Habsburgs. That's how much, and it's ended up becoming the Austro-Hungarian Empire. You ever remember that from World War I? Anyway, but so, these guys were very, very big. So what about this? Well, nothing really changed, though, from our perspective. From a Protestant perspective, we're like, well, you know, what, isn't there a problem with indulgences? No, they continued those. But they just tried to keep them from being abused. So no, we're not going to do that. We're going to, you know, the church. But the problem, what ended up happening, is the church and the state became stronger and stronger. The church and the state became stronger. And so now the church is tied to the state and everything is run by both. And now if, they, if the state doesn't want you to be this religion, you can't be that religion unless you want to go to jail or get, be killed. That's where a lot of these guys are going to have happen to them. They're going to get killed. So here's some things, church, and this is things that came actually from the church and the state. So United States... If you wonder why we did the Constitution, if you ever read the Constitution, the majority of it was, has every, had everything to do with church and the state. They wanted to separate the two. Now, some people get upset. Oh, you don't need church separation. But yes, we do. Because the church and the state, if you are in England, guess what? You're going to be an Anglican. If you're going to be in Germany or Moravia, you're going to be a Lutheran. If you're going to be in Switzerland, you're going to be a Calvinist. You're going to be that way. But in America, you can be whatever you want except for they weren't very happy with the Catholics for a long time. So the French Revolution also, now remember, I even wrote in the French Revolution, remember that was the time when the French actually banned Christianity for over a year. They said no more Christianity. So very good on the, uh, good on the French Revolution over there because the French Revolution was very important. That happened because of it. The, now the communist takeover, now this was, I threw this in there, but this was from the Eastern Orthodox Church, not the Catholics. So the reason why the communists ended up going into it, because the church and Tsar Nicholas II were completely intermingled. And the people were supposed to be re represented by the church, but they weren't. So the problem is the communists, that's why the communism took over. World War II, the Nazis interacted very closely with the, with the Catholic Church. They actually, we know that Nazis were aided by the Catholic Church to escape the, um, Germany afterwards, and they ended up going to places like you know, Argentina and stuff like that through the Catholic Church. So we know the problem. Those are real big problems with the church and state. As you can tell, I'm not a big fan of the church and state. So let's learn about some of the lands. So here's like, this is where my family's from, Switzerland. The Swiss were really in kind of torn between the two big ones for Switzerland are going to be Reformed faith, which we're going to talk about next week, which is Calvinism, Presbyterianism. And the second one is going to be the um, Catholic, Catholicism. Now, and you're going to find through here that my guy actually went from, went from Bern, which was a Catholic state, and he went to Geneva, and that was a, Pro that was a Protestant state. So these are called cantons. But the Swiss, a lot of problems happen here. A lot of the battles happen here because they were fighting to try to see who gets dominance. So this is, the, this is Swiss. So whenever you think Swiss, I want you to think Reformed, which is going to be Presbyterian as time goes on. So think of Calvinism when you think of Switzerland. The Swiss are called cantons. Do you know that the Swiss are actually the Pope's guard? The Swiss are the Pope's guard. The Swiss protect him. That's my, that's my peeps right there. Those are the guys. They are, they've been that way since the very beginning. So Switzerland is still tied <clears throat> to Catholicism. Still tied, a lot of it. 
But you got to remember, one of the things about Switzerland is their biggest claim to fame is they're the ones who sent out all the mercenaries. In the, middle, in the Middle Ages and onward, if you want an army and you didn't, you didn't have one to raise up, go to the Swiss. They'll work, they'll work as mercenaries. We're going to find out that Zwingli actually was, Zwingli was actually there, and we're going to talk about him next week. He actually got killed because he went to battle with these guys. He went in the battles with them. So, the French Huguenots, or Huguenots. Now, it's a strange name, but all you, when you really think about Huguenots, you've got to think Protestant. Just think Protestant. These guys were Reformed. These guys were mainly uh, Calvinist, because uh, that's when Calvin, where Calvin came from. But they were definitely not Catholic. And let me tell you, if you want to, be, you want to see people persecuted, these guys were persecuted. These guys were barely better Literally more, and I forgive me for the inner, the, trying to use this as an example, but they were almost on the line of what we see the slavery was in the 17th and 18th century. They were almost at that point. They maybe had a few more things, but not much. They were, to, they were told what they, where they were supposed to work, who they were supposed to marry, what, what, they, what they can do, what they could not do. If people wanted stuff from their house, the people walked in and just took it. If guards wanted to get rid of them out of town, the guards would come into the city and stay in their house and eat them out of house and home and make the people pay and the people would go poor. If they tried to run away, the state would go grab them and bring them back and kill them for running away. These guys were persecuted. All because they were Protestant. So, now, the persecutions would not end after the Thirty Year War. They're going to continue even into almost the 1700s. So, one of the things that happened is through in 1572, and you'll read about that in the paper, is that they had the St. Bar Bartholomew's Day Massacre. What happened was in France that the Protestants were trying to intermarry with some Catholics because what, so basically the king wanted to king's daughter wanted to marry a Protestant, and they're trying to get him together so we can calm everything down. But they believe it was Dimitri, but the, the queen regent, that's the queen right there. The queen regent, what a queen regent is, is she was in charge, and she basically had a lot of power, but not as much as the king. So but the king was her son. So she basically what happened is when the when the Protestants came in for the wedding, there was a there was an admiral in there, a big guy in the in the in the Huguenots, that they went in and they killed the admiral in bed, tossed him out the window onto the street. The people cut his hands and his head off and drug him through the street, the city streets. Let me tell you guys, it was not very fun to be a Protestant back then. They would drag you, drag you through then. And then they went on a rampage. The people went on a rampage. People said, all right, good. Now we can do this. We go and kill people. So they went and they actually murdered about a few thousand people in the country. It wasn't just in Paris either. It was all over the place. So these guys had it really bad. So they were treated, in my opinion, very similar, not as bad, to the African Americans. Because they couldn't, they couldn't work, they couldn't marry, there was, they, were, they were basically restricted in everything they did. Everything. And not, the worst part about it was, was the fact is, if they tried to flee, they would go get them, bring them back, and they, then they would kill them. So again, that's why I kind of, you can see that you can see there's a little bit of a similarity. They, now, they didn't have all the bad treatment, like, you know, the, the, the devices put on the necks and everything else. But what they did is they actually caused a lot of problems for these guys. They were lower than second class citizens. See, see how they're, they're burning her? That's what they would do. They wouldn't just burn you. They would do burn, they would kill you in cruel ways. They will drown you. 
They will put you on that and drown you. They will put spikes in you. They will do all kinds of things because they hated you. Because you are a Protestant. So the lucky ones, if they ran, the people in Switzerland or whatever, and that's what you're going to find in my story, that they took some, some of these guys in, and they would go to the Netherlands. So if they got out, they were lucky. Most of them did not. All right, let's talk about the Netherlands. So the Netherlands basically were a place where there were very big Calvinist ties. The Netherlands were very big Calvinist ties. And so a lot of the problem, now the problem was these guys were under the Habsburgs' influence. So if you think Habsburgs, you've got to think Spain and Austria. So they were under their influence. So what they finally, basically after the 30-year war, they were actually free from those guys. That's one of the reasons. So just understand that the war was not just of religion, but also because they wanted to be free. Now, uh, there is one mistake up here. Um, Quakers admit, now, actually, this is true, but the Quakers were not, uh, were not Anabaptists. I'm these are mainly Anabaptists. So Quakers and Mennonites, Mennonites were Anabaptists, Quakers were different. So just wanted to let you know there. But what happened was a lot of Quakers came in from, the Quakers came in from England to, because they were being, Quakers were being persecuted in England because they were Anglican. And Quakers were not Anglican. So they were persecuted. So they came, they came to the Netherlands to try to be free. But then they were persecuted because they were Quakers. The Anabaptists were persecuted because they were there too. That's the reason why a lot of the people today speak Dutch. Because a lot of the Anabaptists came to the Netherlands. Ah, the Amish. They speak Dutch. Mm, that's why. They, that's where they went to. That was a, that was, they, they speak Dutch in the Netherlands. So, and by the way, if you didn't know what Pennsylvania means, Penn's Woods, you know, William Penn, the guy that went in there, they called it Penn's Woods, but yeah, that's what that means. So Norway and Sweden. Well, Norway and Sweden, we wouldn't think much about them, but the thing is, they actually were big in the 30-year war. Sweden. Do you know that Sweden actually took out Russia? Sweden took out Russia for a while. 100 years after this, but still. So the guy named Gustavus Adolphus. What a great name. What you know, this called Gustavus Adolphus. I, I don't know, I get my, with my uh, great, Swedish, terrible Swedish accent. So Gustavus Adolphus was the big guy that actually helped win the war. What a great guy. The guy was awesome. So, but these guys were also big time Calvinists. They were big Calvinists. So Gustavus Adolphus was there. All right, German states in Bohemia. The German states were basically were mainly Lutheran. The Germans were Lutheran, okay? Bohemia were more Moravian and Mennonites, okay? Because those Bohemia was really where Jan Hus was. Remember Jan Hus, guy who burned in the stake before Luther? Well, those guys were more Mennonites, okay, and, Mo and Mo uh, Moravians. So, but the German states, also called the Holy Roman Empire, basically was very big hotbed for Lutheranism. Now, if you ever heard of Diedrich Bonhoeffer, if you ever heard him, Diedrich Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran pastor in Nazi Germany. He was killed in concentration camps. But Lutherans have a big tie in the German states. Now, we call it the Holy Roman Empire, but they really weren't holy, they weren't Roman, nor were they an empire, but they were now what we call Germany. So, all right, let's, let's talk about the Anglicans. All right, King Henry VIII, oh, everybody's favorite guy. So King Henry VIII, they were, England was very staunch Catholic until, and then here comes King Henry VIII, okay? This is, this is about eh, 30 years, 35 years after the War of the Roses. And Lancaster is what rose? Red rose. York is what rose? 
White rose, very good, good. Lancaster is red, York is white. That's where they get them from because of, because of the Henrys. Henrys number six, um, six and number seven, by the way. But here comes King Henry, and he marries Catherine of Aragon, so she is, she is um, Spanish. Again, remember what he said about the kings. They marry people from other countries. They intermarry with all the other countries. What's interesting is uh, you'll find even in World War, II, World War I that England had ties because of marriage and relationship to, to Germany, to um, Russia, and I believe it was also Spain and France. There, had all, there was all these ties, so there's all these succession problems. But anyway, that's another story. So King Henry said, all right, Catherine, I want a son. She couldn't give him a son. So he's like, okay, I'm going to divorce you. Ooh, not supposed to do that. That's a very big no-no in Catholicism. Can't do that. So King Henry said, all right, let me come up with some devised way of convincing the Pope. Maybe the Pope will give me, a, give me one of those. And he went to the Pope, and of course the Pope said, eh, can't happen. You have no reason to divorce her. Can't do it. So King Henry decided... Well, if they're going to be that way, I'm going to become Protestant. He actually hated Luther. He hated Luther. He hated everything about the Lutherans. But, you know, people become Protestant, I guess, for interesting ways. So he became Protestant. Just so we can divorce it. Because the, then, then he, so we put a, a new, brand new archbishop who was Protestant, said, oh, yes, you can, of course you can get a, get a divorce. King Henry, sure you can. No big deal. Yeah, that's fine. You're, we're good. You were like, you know, we're good. So the thing is, so he divorced her, and he married another, and he married another, and he married another. Two of them got killed. You know, uh, I think one died in childbirth or something, and the rest went into exile. Finally, the last one, uh, she ended up living past him. So the six, if you were number six, you were lucky because she lived past him. But the thing is, he did this, but he brought in Protestantism. So now we have the Church of England. Now, when you see the word Anglicans, you've got to think way back. You ever heard of the, the Anglo-Saxon? Ah, the Anglo-Saxon? Anglo-Saxon, the Angles and the Saxons actually came to England in about the 5th, 6th century, and that's where we get Angles and Saxons. So... Really, the, the truth is Anglo-Saxonism is not, you know, if we're saying we're, we're, not everybody's Anglo-Saxon. I'm from Switzerland. My family's from Switzerland. I'm not an Anglo-Saxon. We're most likely a little tight, more tied to them. But Anglo-Saxon is usually from England and northern Germany. So the Anglo-Saxons came in. So Anglicans, they took up that name. So Pope wouldn't give it to him. The good news is that what happened was that because Wycliffe, Remember Wycliffe? That was the guy that they burned, threw, it, threw his ashes. They, after he, they uh, dug his bones up, burned it, and threw it, threw it in the River Thames because they, they didn't like that he, what he was teaching Protestantism. But the thing is, so Wycliffe was, they had a small little contingent already there. So let's just use that. And they started building on that. And now that's where we're going to get the Church of England. Again, note the name, Church of England. Church and the state, again, tied together. Now you're going to start seeing why America said, ah, we don't want anything to do with that. So we basically called it Anglican. Why? Because it comes actually on a phrase from the Magna Carta. You've probably heard of that. Magna Carta, 12th, you know, 13th century. It wasn't as much everybody thinks it was. Really, it was basically the rich people of the land didn't like paying taxes to the, to the king and wanted more say, and that's where we get parliament from eventually. Parliament came from them. So kind of like our Senate in the House, that's their parliament. But it came from the, um, the Anglican, so it's basically stated in there, Anglican, the Anglican church shall be free. So they use the word Anglican. Okay, we're going to call it Anglican then. Eh, that's where it came from. So, but the idea of Magna Carta was not as big because most of us little people, Magna Carta didn't do anything for us at that time. Not till a lot later. All right, so Henry went through six wives. All right, two were killed, three divorced, and one final outlived him. Now, the divorced ones didn't have much better life. They had a pretty bad life because their life basically was, guess where you're going to be? You are now going to be locked in a castle somewhere, and you can't leave. Boy, that's a great life. So you may have, may have been a queen. 
you're no longer a queen. So, but now, from there, King Henry actually had a couple daughters. He had Mary and Elizabeth. So they did have a son, but the son died. He was, only, he was king for just a very short time, and he died. So Mary, Mary actually became the next queen of England because they, she belonged to King Henry. Mary was a staunch Catholic. So now we have about 10, 12 years of, of Protestantism going on here. Now, all of a sudden, it's, guess what? I am now the king, queen, and you are now all Catholic again. I mean, can you see the reason why America changed the church and the state, what they did? Because guess what? You're going to be Catholic. Oh, and you don't want to be Catholic? Too bad. And so she went and got the name Bloody Mary because she would go through and she put a lot of the Protestants to death. That's why they call her Bloody Mary. And they, they, have a named, they have a drink named after her. I don't drink, but they have a drink at, named after her. But that's where she did. Now, do we know where Mary, what Mary came to in America? Maryland. Maryland. And guess what religion Maryland was established as? Catholic. Maryland was the main Catholic state, about the only Catholic state, other than a little bit of Rhode Island, Everybody else was not. So that's where Mary comes in. See how this, how this stuff all ties together? You know, we tie everything together. So she was basically, then when, when Mary died, and I think if I remember right, Elizabeth had her, had her killed. But I don't remember if she had her killed or not. But anyway, Elizabeth took over, and Elizabeth was a staunch Protestant. Guess what, guys? We're going back to Protestantism. So the Catholics are like, oh, crap. And everybody else is like, yes. Because guess what you're going to be? Because guess what? If you, now if you're a Protestant, you're okay. But if you're a Catholic, mm, you're not okay. You're going, to become a, you're going to be a Protestant very quickly if you want to live. So, but Elizabeth actually was one of the best, one of the best queens. She was actually quite, quite amazing queen. Now, what, what state is named after Elizabeth? What American state is named after Elizabeth? None but. <laughs> None but. We know she was the virgin queen. Think about it. What state? Virginia. Yeah. Virginia because of the virgin queen. Huh. So, she was a virgin queen, so that's why, yeah. So nothing was named directly after her, but she was the virgin queen. That's where we got Virginia. So, interesting how this stuff. Now, you guys are going to find out that from now on, you're going to start knowing a lot more of the history because we're going to start tying it in. So, all right, Anglican beliefs. First, they're just like the Episcopalians, okay? They can marry. Um, they basically have just Protestant beliefs for the most part, Okay. They do not believe in predestination, as we're going to talk about next week with Calvinism. Uh, they have a confessional system. They also have a book of common prayer. Now, the book of common prayer basically is just all the outlines of how to do everything. Uh, they have prayers in there, all this stuff. If you've ever read books of common prayer, they're actually interesting if you ever want to read them. But they're, they're not like other Protestant denominations because they usually go by that book of common prayer. Now, but nowadays, um, homosexuality is allowed in some Anglican. Uh, Canada started with it and now uh, went a little bit to England. So there's, they're now, you know, ordaining homosexual ministers. And so here, I just kind of took this from the, from the Anglican's Book of Common Prayer. This is basically what they taught. This is all in there. And so literally, it's prayers for this, prayers for this, how to read, readings for today, doing this. They do a lot of things out of this. It's very religious, very religious system. But, you know, it had, it had interesting things going on, but that's just part of it. Now, who came from Anglicanism? C.S. Lewis. Before we start thinking Anglicanism is bad, we got to think that C.S. Lewis actually came from Anglicanism. He was an Anglican. He was Church of England, big time. So, he actually, those are two of my favorite books of his. If you haven't read those two books, they're two of the, the greatest books in the world. 
I love those books. But he was also a friend with J.R.R. Tolkien. But he, Lewis is considered one of the greatest apologeticists of the night of the 20th century. He was amazing. If you've never read C.S. Lewis, please read him. Read his Chronicles of Narnia, because they all are pictures of Jesus just through an allegorical form. Allegorical form. Okay? Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, Out of the Silent Planet is from his Space Trilogy. Basically, what would you do if you go to, a con go to a world that Jesus didn't have to die? Because people, the man never fell. How would, how would it look like? That's, what, that's kind of what that's about. The Great Divorce is about a guy, how a bus going from hell up to heaven to see, you know, can we take people, you know, who's going to go to heaven and stuff. And how many, and it's just an interesting way, kind of understanding to say, how many people say, I don't want to go to heaven, I want to, I want to do my own thing, and they want to continue. It's, it's very interesting. I read it like five, I was so amazed with that book. Good book. So, so basically, C.S. Lewis shows that the God can raise up godly men even in somewhat of a restrictive religion. Okay? And we know, but that's true though, because in the Old Testament, we're almost done, guys. In the Old Testament, Isaiah was, start, was a northern, mostly northern. Jeremiah was southern, but yet he was during Babylonian times. Ezekiel was during the Babylonian in Babylon. Daniel was during Babylon. So basically, times where they weren't even really doing very much for God, God raised these guys up. And that's what C.S. Lewis, we've got to understand that God will raise people up in the midst of hard times and become great men of God. God can do all things. He's pretty amazing. All right, and that's it. So what we're going to do starting next week, please read this. I hope you would please let me know if you enjoy it. I'll write more fiction, more, more than Freddie Chipmunk, of course. So next week, we're going to go start going into the denominations for the most part. We're going to start breaking down what is a denomination, what do they do this, and then we're going to be going in specifically into Anabaptists first, because I know you're all really interested in that, because we're going to talk about Amish and those guys, and then we're going to go into Reformed with Calvinism. So also, we're going to, I'm going to start writing about science, technology, and the, the move away from God. You're going to start seeing how the age of exploration, how, the, how governments became very rich, how they began to, to uh, beat up on their workers, how they had began to do slavery, and how the Vatican... Did you read my, that thing with, uh, when I read my last, through the last one that, that talked about the Vatican said it's okay to be slavery? Did you read that? Because that was part of my last writing. That, the Vatican in the 15th century... At the late, end of the 15th century, so oh, yes, slavery is okay. Terrible, terrible. That's why I wrote it in there. It was terrible. So if you're not, please make sure you read from last week because they talked about how the church became and actually helped so many people out there. All right, guys, thanks so much. Have a great day.